Um, so uh, the virtual meeting statement pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 30A subsection 18 and the governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This the meeting of the Albertson Planning Board will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found at www.hubbardsonma.us. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so despite best efforts, we will post on the town's website an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive records of proceeding as soon as possible after the meeting. Very good. Okay. Um, at, it's not clear you're still supposed to say this, but planning board meetings are broadcast and broadcast live and digitally recorded. They're actually not broadcast live, they're broadcast Zoom. But anyway, I think uh, that's part of the public meeting law if it's not covered in the above statement. Um, members here present tonight are Francois Steiger, Bill Homans, John Damalia, Christopher Monroe, myself, Alice Livedahl Chair, and Erica Dack, who's our alternate member, our associate member, rather. I want to call the meeting to order because that's not only a quorum, but it's everybody. Um, and I'll uh, open the meeting up to public comment if there are any, if anybody out there that wants to speak. If you're speaking to a specific item on the agenda uh, as a member of the public, not as an applicant, um, you will recognize you during that discussion of that event. Do you have other people out there, anybody? No, Mallory? Okay. All right. Also a chance to comment at the end. Um, if somebody arrives late. Um, so we don't have minutes to approve this time, correct? So we'll, move right, so we'll move right into action items. Our action items tonight are two uh, scenic road application hearings, a, a review of a special permit application for completeness, and a, a look at a proposal for an environmental study of the gravel pit. So we'll moving along with those, we'll make our first item of business. A, it's a public hearing. So on a scenic road application. So I'll call that public hearing to order. Um, and the, the applicants are Jeffrey and Nancy Dennis. Mallory, do you wanna read the posting? Can you do that for me? All right, so pursuant to provisions of MGL 40 subsection 15C, the Hubbardson Planning Board will hold a public hearing on 3-18-21 at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom under scenic road application for installation of driveway located at map and parcel 08-64B, lot 4D, Healdville Road. This property is owned by Jeffrey and Nancy Dennis. Plans may be viewed at the Planning Board office during official business hours. Okay, thank you. Um, so. There was a plan submitted with this um, late, but um, quite detailed. It's taken from their, um, or their, what was it? Septic. Uh, septic system plan. That it does include, yeah, it does include much of the, uh, if not all of the detail needed. Um, and I'm gonna give them a chance to speak, but just for the sake of the public, um, this is a parcel, the, the, the application seeks to remove, they say nine trees, our arborist says it's actually 13, that's gauged by the diameter of the tree, and 15 feet of stone wall, basically for a driveway installation. So those trees are um, in the town's right of way and then this section of the wall. The property, this, this lot, map eight, lot 64B, is almost 10 acres, 9.72 acres, and it has frontage on the road of about 653 feet. So they're only looking to deal with a driveway opening. Um, so what, 15 of those 563 feet. Um, so are they here? I'll recognize them and they can tell us a little bit about their plan. Yeah, and then we'll here. go through the criteria. 
Nancy, can you hear us? Nancy? She's muted, I think. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> I don't think so. All right, well, maybe she just wants to listen. Um, and maybe you can figure it out. If you figure it out, I'll let her in. So I did want to say this was sent out. And so in addition to the plan, we have a letter from Jeff Bork. I don't know that I'm saying his name right. Is that right? I think so. OK. Um, um, saying he did look at the trees um, to be cut. He doesn't opine on the wall. It's the trees. And he said there were a total of 13 trees. Um, and they're a 24, 24 inch red oak, an eight inch sugar maple, a 10 inch sugar maple, he's categorized them all. Um, and they were all tagged for him. So he has, he has reviewed it. And of course, a driveway opening would be an allow, allowed um, under our scenic bylaw. So, I hope everybody's had a chance to look at it. Are there questions from the board member about their plans to the applicants? No, no questions from me, Alice. Okay, and Nan is Nancy been unmuted now? Mary? It looks like it, yep. Nancy, is there anything you'd like to say? Nancy Dennis? Oh, um, I know that Jeff's here with me. Um, I know that we just wanted to build the house and I know the rocks were in the driveway area and also we wanted to cut those trees to avoid hitting the house, et cetera, <laughs> after you know, we're done building in that. That's why I went for the permit for the trees. Nancy, um, the pictures, because I think because of the snow cover of the wall, mm -hmm. weren't, weren't very clear to me anyway. Um, it, are these like a, a, just a row of stones? Or are these stones piled upon stones? Or describe the wall a little bit. I know. It's really at the beginning of the wall. They're kind of like kind of thrown on the ground. But if you go like maybe 10 feet over, then they start stacking them where it looks like an actual stone wall somewhat, but it's kind of buried from the road too. So it's kind of like gravel and then you'll see a stone. I mean, it's not very high. Okay. So okay. it's just kind of like there. And these stones that you're going to take out, are you going to use them elsewhere? It is one um, part. Well, actually, after we're all done building, I would like to totally rebuild the stone wall because we built a stone wall at our house and I love it. So my plans are to rebuild the stone wall. My husband might not be too excited about that, but, <laughs> but that's what I'd like to do is rebuild the stone wall because I like the look of the stone walls. And do that, does that stone wall run that very long frontage that you have? Sort of the same, just stones piled? It doesn't run on the, I would say, the eastern end of it, but it's on the the other end. It's more of an organized stone wall. Where the driveway is, it just drops off to, it's almost like the, it disintegrated into the ground. There's not, there's only a couple rocks laying there. So you, you remove less, less stones <laughs> than elsewhere. All right, well, just for the sake of the public, um, the, with the things that the, Planning board supposed to contribute, and this will carry over to the next scenic road hearing too. Our criteria A through O, which are the contribution of the trees of the stone walls to scenic beauty, the age historic significance of the trees and the walls, features of the road, such as surface and pavement and width, which um, which are shown on your plan. Public safety, uh, local residential traffic patterns. Um, compensatory actions proposed, such as reusing the stones or planting new trees. Functional importance of the project, obviously this is access to the whole property. Additional evidence contributed by the abutters or interested parties. Uh, it is a public hearing. So again, if there's public that wants to speak, we'll call for your comments in a minute. Uh, recreational uses of the road, preservation of natural resources and historic resources, scenic and aesthetic characteristics, environmental value, other planning information, existence or absence of reasonable alternatives, and the applicant's reasons and considerations, which I think we've covered. So I think they've met that criteria possibly, but does anybody have other questions about any, any of them in spe specifically? Alice, Bill Holmes, I don't have any questions. 
Okay, and is there anybody, any butter that wants to speak that weighed in or wrote anything or Mallory, anybody? Have you heard from anybody? Nope, I didn't get anything. Okay. So yeah, I'll, also, I'll make a motion to grant the application. Okay. So is there a second? This is John Demelia. I will second. Okay, we'll do a um a voice vote to approve the scenic road application as shown on the plan and referenced in the application. There is a correction in the application, by the way, which is um they see the they cite the previous deed and they've made that correction in our letter or will reflect it. Um so it's been moved, it's been seconded. Further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call, we'll call for a roll call vote. You have to do names on Zoom. We'll start you with maybe Bill. Bill Holman's aye. Want to just keep going? Sure. Monroe, aye. Councilor Steiger, aye. John Demelia, aye. That's everybody. Okay, it's approved and you will get a letter in the mail. Um, Confirming that soon. Okay. So thank you for appearing and good luck with your project. Okay. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, the second scenic road hearing also has um, quite uh, a nice plan and description of the project. It's from the East Cobb and Land Trust um, and, and involves a an opening of a stone wall on Lombard Road. And I think speaking, who is here for the East Quabbin Land Trust? Uh, Alice, it doesn't look like anyone was here. I emailed the applicant, the person who was acting as the um, representative, but I haven't heard back anything. Okay, well, we can probably act on basically what's here because yeah. um, it's quite detailed. Uh, the, the, the proponent on behalf of the Land Trust in the application is Cynthia Henshaw. Um, so this project, well, start, we'll start with the lot, first of all, East Cobb and Land Trust, you all know is a, you know, it's a land trust. Uh, it's a big lot called Henry's Grove Reservation. It is map 12, lot 20, contains 94 acres with 1,728 feet of frontage. So it's this huge lot. And what they're looking to do is to remove 20 feet of old stone wall to allow for two parking spaces at the reservation for people that want to hike it. Um, and they want to use the wall and I guess supplement it with other stones to fence the back of this little two lot parking lot as shown on the plan. And the plan shows where the stones, they have been removed because they removed them from an access road in order to put in this access road for cutting. And I believe the way our bylaw reads is they, the highway superintendent could have given them permission to remove, to remove them if they were going to replace them where they were removed, but that's not what they're planning to do. They're planning to place them around the perimeter of these two parking spaces. So are there questions from the, from the board about what they're planning to do? Um, questions from the public? You know what I didn't do, Mallory, is um, is actually read into the record the, I don't know, is that part of the public hearing? I think it probably should be read in. Yeah. I'll read it quickly. It says, uh, do you want me to do it? Yeah, do it for me. Pursuant to the provisions of Master No Law Chapter 40, Subsection 15, the Hubbardston Planning Board will hold a planning We'll hold a hearing on 3-18-21-631 via Zoom under Scenic Road application for installation of a parking lot at Mappin Parcel 12-070 Lombard Road. The property is owned by East Club and Land Trust. Okay. Probably should have preceded. So I can, if there are no public, there's no presenter here, there's no questions from the board. Well, I can close the public hearing in any event, having opened it. And any comments from the board? If not, does some want, want to make a motion to approve? This is John Demelia. I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, so this is to um, approve the application of the East Quad and Land Trust as shown on the plan. Um, I would like to, at this point in time, second a motion. This is Francois Steiger. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. No further discussion. Um, we can take a vote. 
I, I hate to start off the voting. Let somebody else start. Bill Homans, I vote aye. John Demelia, aye. Councilor Shire, aye. Christopher Monroe, aye. And Alice Lipdahl, aye. Okay, so that's approved, and we we will get letters out to these applicants of approval. Okay, thanks, Mally, and thanks for helping me <laughs> clarify the questions. No, I think the first one. Okay, so our third item of um, action item on our agenda is to, it regards 56 Gardner Road, um, and I know the applicant is here, uh, Bowie Berthold from Paper Crane Provisions, LLC, and I know Bill Murray is here, our consultant, um, and the purpose is not tonight to, you know, rule on the merits, it's to determine whether the application, which includes um, a site plan application, a special permit application, and a community impact analysis, whether those documents and plans are complete enough so we can accept his application and schedule a public hearing. And we also have to touch on the matter of fee here for our consultant before we do that. But I'm sort of privileged in this because I got to hear um, Bowie talk about this at the round table meeting. And it was quite informative. And Boeing, if, you, if you're willing to just give a small overview like you did to the round table group and also explain the two phases and the multiple buildings and your plans, um, I'd appreciate it. Can you do that for us? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. Happy to uh, try and give you a, an, an overview of the whole project here. So the special permit that I've submitted to you guys with the, the special permit, the site plan review is in, uh, I'm proposing a tier six outdoor, just a, a one year outdoor um, marijuana cultivation project at 56 Gardner Road. We want to use the property um, as is. So we're not, <clears throat> you know, building anything except a fence or what we, we would basically be applying for building permit wise would be a fence. We would use the buildings as is um, to dry and cure the marijuana that we will grow in the backfield, which was um, from what I understand, a apple orchard for a long time. And uh, we're gonna put up a fence, nobody will see it. Um, we'll harvest starting around the 10th of September. We'll finish up around October 1st. We're gonna bring everything into the green building, which is formerly the stove shop. And, um, and then the front sort of yellowish beige building, which is formerly um, the golf cart machine shop slash auto body shop. Uh, formerly owned by Ken Erickson. We're, and that's it. We're going to dry cure our cannabis that we bring out of the field um, in those buildings. And uh, that would be phase one. So um, phase one is really the only phase that you guys have information on right now. On um, phase two, I've referenced it in the special permit. And that is... Um, you know, we're hoping to get everything squared away engineering wise to build some greenhouses. Um, I think we will be allowed um, uh, for about between 12 and 14,000 square feet of greenhouse in terms of uh, the DCR, like what our allowance will be on the buildable section. Uh, and then um, we're going to build 9,000 square feet of new manufacturing and processing, which is if you're looking at the special permit plan that I submitted, it's in the courtyard that the cars will be parking in this summer. We're going to build there if we, you know, if everything goes the way we would like it to go and um, have a kind of a more uh, high end, complete, full service, more or less marijuana production facility where we would be growing, doing some manufacturing and that and packaging as well. And um, and uh, then the development of the retail store in the stove shop. 
So that would be uh, that would be like the trifecta of sort of the vertically integrated nature of what the company is going for: grow, manufacture products, package, and sell right out of that, um, right out of the stove shop. And then also, you know, the big money maker would be um, also obviously wholesaling our cannabis to other companies. So phase one would be just the outdoor sort of putting up a fence, using the property as is fairly, um, you know, low impact. And, um, and then phase two would be you know, a little more substantial of a build. But um, I actually just got my variance packet back from my architect right now. So I, I'm going to be uh, submitting it on Monday morning. I just got about 10 minutes ago, um, like, you know, the article 10 that's been completed. So I know I've been, I know I talked to Bill Murray about this back in December. Um, Bill, it's, um, I'll be finally moving forward with that variance, I'm applying for the variance from the ZBA for some parking. And that would um, basically once we settle the parking situation, then uh, phase two would sort of, that would be the next, um, I guess, uh, you know, an amendment to the special permit. It would be the completion of the special permit, so to speak. Question for you, are you going to build the greenhouses where you're going to have the fields now? So the greenhouses are part of phase two. It's just a fence and the open field right now. That's it. But you would build those greenhouses on the open field. Yes, I would build, I would build them on, you know, if we're going back to my property, I would build them on the buildable section of that property, which we have, you know, figured out in terms of the, we're allowed 10% of that um, non permeable allowance from the, the outer watershed. So we ha we have it, you know, figured out exactly how much we can build, what we would ask to build, and then we would just, I guess, try and settle it from that, figure it out from there. It just seems to me that this is less of a phase one and phase two situation than it is a maybe what you would call a temporary special permit or a time limited special permit until it's superseded, right? Yeah, and it's well, well. Yes, it's it's it's. I guess it's really a. Um, I guess it's sort of like a temporary, I guess, just because who knows, once we get the parking variance, if we get the parking variance, you know, after I, I'll submit the variance on Monday, on Monday morning, they have, I think, uh, 14 or 30 days to give me a date for a hearing. After I have the hearing, they have 100 days, you guys all know this to sort of decide. So that takes us like well into the summer. So this is this phase one is really an interest of not missing this growing season. Okay, um, so it would be superseded by, it's really not phase two, it'd be superseded by another special permit that covers the same, the entire. Exactly, a, a, much, a much denser and more complicated special permit with, you know, new construction of the greenhouses and the uh, manufacturing space. Yep. Okay, so, but at this point, we're just looking at whether, you know, it's a, a completed application for this first, we're going to call it phase one, but the first plan, growing only, right? So, um, again, it includes a special permit. He's enclosed in the packet, which, uh, again, I don't know who's listening from the public, but includes special permit application, a site plan review application, a community impact statement, and a number of plans showing how it's being used and where the dividing lines are in terms of uh, the MDC restricted lands. Um, and I note that in your list, and I wanna hear from Bill, but again, for the public, it's it, uh, map, map five, parcel 80, about 2.66 acres. Um, and you're going to be, it's going to actually be under um, cultivation. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Um, and the two metal buildings that you're going, that are on the property will only be used as cure buildings, but there's not, but you'll have like blower fans and the restroom up and going and so forth for your workers, right? That are picking it. Yep. So there's two in the front building. There's two bathrooms, two just half baths, um, you know, that are in working order. 
And um, in terms of fans, that's really, I'm going to, I'm just going to wheel in, um, you know, big U-line shop fans that oscillate in the corners of the room. And, you know, they, they, they make these dehydrators that you, uh, or dehumidifiers that you just roll in as well and plug in their 110. And it's, you know, pretty just really just using the enclosed space of the buildings. Okay. And you had said at the round table hearing, there's a, um, a heater in that building that you may may use to help get it uh, during the, the freezes while you're getting the germination started. Is that right? Uh, yep. Yeah. So there's a, there's a gas heater in the front building and um, the, the plumber was looking at it last week. I mean, it, it needs work. So, you know, anything we're going to be at, you know, adding, obviously um, we're, we'll be uh, just, you know, regular plumbed permitted stuff, but you know, it's a, it's a nice, really nice big Resner heater that I think will be functioning, but just needs a little work. Okay. And then you say right in your application, you're going to replace the, I don't know what you would call it, the, the plastic skin, you call it around the, you call it a high tunnel, but it's a half, that half arched built tubular building. In yeah, the well, I, I call those, hoop, we call those hoop houses in the cannabis or, you know, world, but yeah, so that would be um, just a new clear plastic uh, skin with some shade cloth inside that sort of, you know, filters out the UV rays, um, just standard agricultural stuff. Is that inside the fenced area? Yes. Okay, so that's your security while you're growing these in part. I mean, it's, you want to talk a little bit about security too? Sure. So I know at the round table, I still don't have my security plan back. I expect to get it back tomorrow or early next week. And um, it's going to be uh, from what I've, you know, from what I have walked the property with the consultant a couple of times and basically going to be cameras in the building. Um, uh, and then, you know, on all doorways and wherever marijuana is going to be hanging and drying, there's going to be a camera on it at all times. There's going to be three to four pole cameras in the field um, or along the fence, depending on sort of what he decides. I'm not really sure. Those are the two options. And that's just standard what they do. They either put a couple on poles with 360 degree, uh, you know, camera views, or um, they place some around the the perimeter of the fence. Okay, and you want to say just a word about lighting as well? I know you want. Um, yeah. I know that's a big concern. So there's no, um, there's no like, there's no bright lights at night, especially um, if anybody doesn't know this. So you know, with outdoor, with marijuana in particular, you you don't want any light contamination. Um, no artificial light ever once they're especially in a you know even early and mid and then you know later flowering because um it'll it actually confuses the plant and will force them to go to seed which kind of ruins your product a little bit um to some degree it depends on how bad they get flashed with light but um there's no we're not putting up any lighting other you know anything that ken already had up on the buildings will stay um but no new no new lighting, you know, or, you know, it, I'll maintain the dark sky and that's, that's what I would like as well. Okay. And then finally, and then I want to get Bill's take on it and I want to get the, anybody in the board to be able to ask questions. Uh, but can you, can you tell us about your, so the request has been sent to the division of water supply protection regarding land use exemption. Um, you want to just Talk about that a little bit and whether you've heard from them, DCR. Sure. So the about the back third or maybe quarter of my property is um, within the the outer buffer zone of a uh, what's considered a watershed surface uh, or yeah, a watershed Prote protection act surface water, and um, or a, maybe a vernal pool. So I hired uh, Goddard. Uh, wetlands consulting and we put together an advisory ruling uh, a request for an advisory ruling to pull this fence permit for this outdoor uh, cannabis grow and to you know plant uh, cannabis in the in the watershed so um, about 
for the proposed area that I'm going to be planting, about two thirds of it is in this watershed. And I have, um, I don't know if you guys, all, if, the pa if the letter from the DCR was distributed throughout the packets of the planning board. Yes. It, it was, yeah. okay. So they, they, gave, they gave me a, um, basically a green light. They said I could proceed with, um, you know, if, as long as I followed the conditions of the advisory ruling that we sort of laid out. So it said, I believe I don't have it in front of me. I think it said you, your project can proceed without any further review, but you guys have it there in front of you. Okay, so that that includes not just the fencing, but the but the planting. Yep. Okay, so um, let's hear from Bill's response again. Our goal tonight is to determine to determine whether we have a com complete application, basically. So, Bill, do you want to weigh in? I, you you have to unmute. Yeah, I saw that little red bar. So the information that they submitted is accurate and complete enough to initiate the, a review by my office and for the planning board to accept it as a valid submission. Which is not to say that I won't uh, have a lot of comments, I will, uh, especially after our conversation earlier today. Okay. Um, so are there questions from the board concerns that, that things you want to ask him at this point that you want to have him elaborate on or anything? if I may this is uh, from so very quick question the cameras that you're using uh, is it fair to assume that these are cameras that do or not only work during the daytime uh, but also at night yes Yep, similar to like hunting cameras, they're they're um, you know motion censored, I guess, uh, and night you know night vision, like they have uh, full imagery. So, requirement I believe is that they have to be able you have to be able to see uh, you know a certain quality of image um, if there is like you know uh, if if the camera's triggered. So yes, they see uh, night and day. Do they have any flash or anything like that would trigger a light? In the event that a motion is uh, is perceived, no. So Bill mentioned that, um, and again, I haven't gotten my security back from American uh, American Alarm yet. I've gotten uh, so I'm not sure if I mean I can't have any lights flash. So if anything, it would be a red or a green light, and it would be um, you know directed probably just down at the ground or at the fence, wherever I'm assuming there might be a. Uh, there might be an action. Okay. One other question I have, and it really has to do with the fact that since you are in a uh, in a in a sensitive zone where water is um, um, involved, it might be a little bit premature. But I'm trying to understand the significance of the agricultural component because it, it, it is an agricultural product in some ways because you are you are growing plants, uh, marijuana plants. Any, any kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, either pesticide or uh, other, uh, like for example, the fertilizers that you are using, if anything at all, um, for the purposes of the growing. Can you elaborate in terms of what, what, your, what your plans are? And, and, and if not, then that's fine. But I'm just trying to understand what it is that you're doing, especially so close to a sensitive area. Sure. Um, so this was a big part of the advisory ruling is, um, is you know it is us sort of stating that this is going to be a totally organic grow. So um, all I want to do is kind of basically just till the soil, um, maybe add some local uh, animal compost, you know, either cow or chicken compost, till it in, and um, I you know I've had the soils tested by a couple of different uh, universities, and it's actually. Um, pretty much perfect, ready. It doesn't even need much amending at all. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be basically um, a very limited, I haven't gotten the, so let me step back. The Watershed Protection Bureau has a, actually their own list of things because there are lots and lots of agro, agricultural project, product, projects in the watershed. They have their own list of what is acceptable in the watershed and, and what's not. So whatever we end up using, aside from just um, preparing the soil when we uh, harrow it and till it 
and turn it before we plant will be on something, only things from the Watershed Protection Act list that are acceptable uh, nutrients and amendments, wherever they may come from, we're going off that list. If what that is on that list, I think there are a lot of things on that list that are not organic, which we won't be using. So we're only going to be using, I mean, this is going to be a very grassroots. This is one of the wonderful things about this plant. A lot of people see the fancy buildings and the, the $10 million buildings where you grow all this really high-end cannabis, but this is an extremely like hardy, resilient plant that doesn't require very much at all. I mean, they, they do call it weed for a reason. It kind of just grows like a weed. Thank you. Are there other questions? Yes, this is Christopher. Yes, I Christopher. would like to, to echo the concern that's already been expressed and you've somewhat addressed it. The, the security components of what you presented so far is definitely anemic. Um, and although it, it, it doesn't rise to the level of being incomplete, it's definitely something that we need to see further elaboration on. Absolutely. As soon as I get my um, site plan and my architectural plans that I'm waiting for, I still don't have them back that have the cameras and the whole over. I mean, this is the biggest thing for the, can, uh, the, the cannabis commission is your security plan. They more people fail, uh, you know, final inspections for security protocols, you know, lacking thereof. So as soon as I have it, I will forward it to you guys. And I mean, these, this is, this security plan will be the most expensive part of this whole project. I mean, it is, it's extensive. It's, it's, it's jaw dropping <laughs> how, how much they load these product, these properties up with, um, with cameras. And Bill knows that. I mean, it is, it's, it's crazy. So Madam Chair, I just want to interject here. Yes, please go ahead. <clears throat> just for the guidance of the, the planning board members, um, what I've mentioned to Bowie and, and the other applicant is that they do not want to make their security plan part of the public record in front of the planning board. What they do want to do, and they probably absolutely have to do, is get approval of the details of the security plan through the police chief. Because once it's in the public record, it's available to anybody that wants to peruse the file. Uh, and we've done this in many, many other towns that we consult in. So we don't, yes, the backbones, or the, the, the description of what the security plan is should be made part of the record, but the details and the actual location of cameras and those kind of things should be shared with the police chief outside of the public realm and we should receive his approval uh, and of course, the Cannabis Control Commission will do the same thing. Um, but I would strongly recommend that the planning board not ask for the details of the security plan um, because we don't want it out there and we should rely on our police chief for that. Copy that, okay. Alice, uh, Bill Holmans, I totally agree with that. I, I believe that was part of the plan in the beginning also. Yep. Bowie, where do you stand with conservation? Is are they very involved in this in the Board of Health? Do you have to redo that septic system or what's the story with those two? I mean the, the bathrooms work. I mean they've been there, they've been working. We're just gonna use them as is. When we go into the larger phase of this special permit, then it's gonna be um, then it's gonna be a, you know, that will be a whole new septic system to accommodate, um, which will be many more bathrooms in the what I'm gonna be building. But that's all outside this growing area this year. Yes. Yes, okay, and um, okay, and CONCOM, do you have wetlands that are, what? what? So my advisory ruling is um, contingent. It says it right, you know, if you guys look at it, um, it says there, um, it, the, the Hubbard Stink Conservation Commission has to sign off on, yes on wetlands vegetation, I think. So um, I'm on the Conser Com Conservation Commission's uh, schedule for their next meeting, whenever that is. I think it's April, uh, April, 6th. April 6th, yeah, <laughs> yes. Okay, so um, Mallory, if we were gonna have this public hearing, and again, we would take an exception from it, they got their own jurisdiction, I realize that. What, um, 
what date would be what date would be feasible for a public hearing on this application? Um, well, we need to put it in the newspaper for at least two weeks and get the abutters notices out. So it wouldn't be for our next meeting. It would be for the following one. So the mid April. What is our third week in April? We have a calendar. I should have one. I should have figured this out. Right? <laughs> okay. Let's see. It's playing open. The third Thursday is the fifteenth. Thanks, Bill. You are yep. tax day. Tax day. <laughs> no, okay. they're pushing so it back a month. Before we, I think that uh, take a vote to determine it complete and schedule the public hearing, which I think should take a vote. Um, I do want to ask about our consultants fee. So I'm hoping, uh, um, Bowie, that you got this copy of the the letter that says you're resetting a budget because it's a different project than the first project. Um, and maybe you guys can can tell me where this stands. It says, is the board, this is from Bill's letter, is the board is aware we extensively reviewed the initial submittal and advised the board not to accept the application it was as it was not complete, which it wasn't at the time. That initial review resulted in a 13 page review. We invoiced against our original proposal um, the amount was $3,400. And it says, by this letter, we're advising the board that if a new submittal is made, which it has been, we would need to reset the budget back to the original estimate of $6,700. Any new filing will need to update and address the many comments and concerns and so forth. So are you are you aware of that? I Oh, yeah. I am, yeah, I, I am. So um, I can, you know, I can drop off a check tomorrow. Okay. So I'm not in the office on Fridays, Bowie, so next week will be good. Uh, I'll drop it off on um, Monday. I know you guys won't get it till Tuesday, but I'll drop it off with the variance. Perfect. Form. All right. Okay. So that's, we all agreed on because um, obviously we're the people that pay Bill. He consults us, but. Not a problem at all. So. Um, Alice, I'll, we have a member of the public with a hand raised, Tom Bracco. Okay. Um, we'll hear from the member of the public. Mr. Bracco, go ahead. All right, hold on. I just need to promote him to be able to speak. All right, Tom. Are we all set? You can hear me? I can hear you. Yes, Tom. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, the, I'm, I'm just a bit confused. The, he's talking about these different phrase, phases. Um, the special permit, is it only for phase one or is it for all three or all two phases? Well, what he explained to us is basically this shouldn't be looked at is so much a phase one or two because his next project will cover the same piece of land. So this is a special permit just to do the cultivation, outdoor cultivation, you know, and curing in the existing building, uh, buildings this year. Well, possibly next year, but it, it won't go beyond that. And his next submissal, submission will supersede this whole permit special permit. Is that, is that correct? Correct. Did, Tom, does that answer your question? I think so. Thank you. I'll wait to look at the documents when, we, when they're available. Thank you. Yeah, go on the website. You can access them, his submission. Oh, okay. Um, and they're, they're quite, they're quite detailed, uh, but they're, they're, you know, it's very different than the first plan, maybe eventually. Um, you know, as you bring in those other elements, the selling and the shop and so on, you know, you'll get a, a better view of what the finished product will look like, but this is an, an interim special permit, basically. All right, so can I have a vote to accept um, the application for, we should be a little specific about these. You know. See if I can word it and then somebody can just make that motion. To accept the application of Paper Crane Provisions LLC to do an out, uh, outdoor cultivation of marijuana at 56 Gardner Road uh, as presented. Um, to accept his applications uh, as submitted as being complete and to schedule a public hearing for April 15th. Alice, Bill Holm. Bill Holman, okay. so I make that motion. This is John Danelia. I second that motion. 
Any further discussion of the motion? Hearing none, we'll uh, move to a vote, starting with John, maybe. John Demelia, aye. Bill Homans, aye. Livedahl, aye. Christopher Monroe, aye. Councilor Steiger, aye. Okay, that's great. All right, we will see you on April 15th. And could I ask uh, one more question of the yeah. board? Um, I wanted to be added to the uh, next planning board meeting agenda for the sign off for my zoning uh, compliant, like compliance of zoning. You guys, you know, have, I have done this before. It basically says that I'm not, uh, you know, near a school or, and my project is, is, uh, is zoning compliant, basically. Uh, it's for the, for the CCC. You know, I'm aware of that provision. I'm trying, and I don't, I don't mind giving you that date. I just think that we shouldn't have to do the work. You should have to do the work. <laughs> so in your letter where you're making that request, can you measure how far it is from the schools and just put it in a letter to us? Um, sure, no problem. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Oh yeah, no, 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 Absolutely, yep. Because um, otherwise I just never can get everything looked at that's supposed to be looked at. For I, I believe Roland is the one who signs off on that. I, I have emailed him. Um, I, I think he's the one who actually, uh, who, who signs off on that, on it the zoning. Be, because he is our zoning enforcement agent. That's right. Yep. So well, it's, I don't um, know that you even need us. No, we have to endorse it, Alice. Oh, we do? Yeah. Okay. If you, for us to sign too. if you can get hold of Roland and get that letter from him, that determination and come before us. We'll put you. We'll put you tentatively on the agenda anyway. It's April first. Okay. You may be having trouble. She's be very busy right now, but. All um, right. We'll, we'll plan on you. We will put it on. Thank you. you. Can't overrule him. It's his determination. You know, it's half the battle here is sorting out who's in charge of what. So. Well, we thank you. All right. We thank you, everybody. Amount of effort you've put into this. So. Good night. Yes. Schmidt has his hand up as well. Who does? Damon. Damon. Yes. Okay. All right. Hold on. Let me promote him. Hang on. Don't leave yet, Bowie. Okay. All right. Damon, you're in. You're on mute, Damon. <laughs> I'm mute. I'm mute. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for letting me speak. Um, I just had a quick question. I uh, spoke with Bill earlier today, um, and I guess Roland had some concerns uh, about hooking up electricity to our trailers. Um, and what I wanted to see is, you know, what's the possibility sometime later next week, you know, that we could set up a call with my electrician, the planning board, maybe maybe Alice wants mm -hmm. to take that. And you know, Roland, and find out you know what exactly does he want, so we can just do it. Uh, you know, we're running out of time here, so I kind of thought maybe if we could set up a meeting between everybody um, and bring my electrician on, we can kind of solve this all at once. And obviously, you know, Bill would be you know be great if Bill could join as well. Damon, I don't, I have no jurisdiction over electric as a planning yeah. board. I don't, and I'm going to be in Florida. Oh, nice. So anyway, but if you can set up something with Bill and try to resolve it, I don't know. I'll let Bill answer that question. Yeah, I don't think the planning board should get in anywhere near that topic. All right. <clears throat> it's the billing inspector. Certainly, if you want to drag me into it, I, as I explained to you earlier, um, I don't know anything about the electrical code. Uh, and it's not, it, it only pertains to the planning board with the sufficiency of utilities. Um, all right. So yeah, it's it was just a heads up to uh, tell you that there was a, a bump in the road. All right. We all right. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. We can go ahead with the hearing. I mean, in the end, the things that aren't in our jurisdiction, we wind up taking an accept. You know, saying yes, you gotta solve what you know. You have to have the appropriate permits, etc. Right? Yeah. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm just trying to find out what I need. So. Okay. All right. It's not right. in our jurisdiction, so. Yeah, all right, great. I'll reach out to Bill and maybe I can set something up with Bill and Roland on the phone so I can find out what I need to do. Okay. All right, thank all you. Right. Yep, thank you. 
Thanks, everybody. Okay, we will Good night, everyone. see you on April 15th. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we need to vote as just the planning board, all I suppose, also to to sign the agreement for bill services. Is is that figure all right with everybody? We have to accept that. Bill Holmes, I'll make a motion to accept. It's the uh, the original estimate of sixty seven hundred dollars as consulting fees on this project going forward. Can I have a second? John Demelia, I second. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Let's vote. Lived all aye. Holmes aye. Demelia aye. Tiger aye. Monroe aye. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bill's not going anywhere. He's. We need him to weigh in on a few other things here. I wanted to try to keep things together. Okay, hang on one second. Let me group, regroup one second. Okay, so our next item of business this has been before us again. Um, it involves the phase two environmental site assessment work. Uh, to be done by VHB consulting firm on lot 57, which is the old gravel pit in town. And just sort of to refresh everybody's recollection and inform the public. Um, this was an old gravel pit. We had a preliminary paper review done of uses and history and so on. And it determined that uh, why there does there isn't um, a huge amount of contamination that's obvious, uh, you know, an old seeping oil drums or, or anything. They did discover that there was, <clears throat> had been used, determined that it had been used um, as a rifle range, practice range by the police department and that road sweepings had been deposited and therefore raised the questions of how much uh, groundwater or ground and groundwater contamination there might be. So um, they recommended um, that we, they do actual on ground testing. So they have this four page proposal. We have funds that to cover this. Um, it's, it, it's labor of $6,800, expenses of um, $7,700. It involves um, taking 15 soil borings from designated spots, um, testing for metals conductivity pH total petroleum, you know, TPH, volatile organics, uh, and, so, and several other agents that they, they're included on the test. Um, and they send these out and it would tell us the groundwater is affected at least perhaps, although they say, depending on the results, uh, water, more water testing might be required and that would, they would come back because that's not covered in this. But would give us some idea whether we could go to the next day, step and, you know, ass assume it's developable land without a lot of remediation. They do say in the note that if the soil sampling reveals there's um, contaminants which require reporting to Mass DEP, they would do that, uh, and then we would have to do that remediation as well, or the town or somebody would do would have to pay for that. Um, is anybody from BHB here, Mallory? Uh, no. No. All right. Well, I was going to ask them. They say if you have to remove contaminated soil, it's three hundred and fifty dollars per drum. Which, so I'm thinking, well, what what's the upside in the number of drums? I really don't know. You can't you can't prejudge the outcome until it's done, right? But I have talked with Ryan actually before he deployed. Um, he's in favor of going forward with it. I talked to Bill. He says, yeah, yeah, you really should do this um, so that you don't spend a lot of money on plans that you can't go forward with because there's contamination issues. The problem I have with it is the money comes out, will come out of um, the 50,000 appropriated in 2016 annual meeting. You know, and once again, it's going for soil studies rather than brick and mortar for, to build something. But until we have land to build on, um, you know, it's kind of where we are. So 
are the questions regarding this proposal, if you didn't have a chance to read it, because I know it came in late, I'm happy to bump it to another meeting, but if we're ready to go to go on it, we could vote on it tonight. Thoughts? Bill, what do you think? I, I don't think you have a choice. Um, the phase one said that there's reasonable cause to look for, look in greater detail. And if you're gonna consider this land to be developable, you have to do it. Otherwise you have to take it off the table. Well, thank you for that opinion, Bill Holmes. I'll make a motion. Can I, okay, you can go ahead. I had a question. I, I will send the motion. No, no, it, 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 I just have a quick question. Are there, per, are there perchance any EPA grants for this type of remediation that we uh, may have, maybe you know, that, that could be explored? I, I, I just don't know, I'm just asking. This is considered to be heavy metals, obviously, lead, potential cadmium and some other uh, uh, mixed uh, uh, metals. So I'm kind of wondering if there is the potential for that to exist that could be leveraged here and mitigate some of the cost. That's a great question. Can I answer that, Madam Chair? Yeah. Um, not until you get the test results back. Okay. Because then, then, then you have a cause of action. <laughs> I think we had a second opinion there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I understand that. So I, I would agree. Uh, but so even for the testing purposes, there's not, there's no such grants, right? There are brownfield grants that once it's determined to be dirty, um, we can probably get through housing and urban development, HUD. Um, that makes sense. And one of the things that I think you all should know is the street sweepings are usually a problem because they carry heavy metals, brake pad re residuals and things the like that. Business. But because this is such a porous sand and gravel and an amazing filter, and it's been there for a very long time, I don't think that we're gonna find groundwater contamination. I think all we're gonna find are the lead, the heavy metals and things like that, that stay resonant in the soil because they don't wash away or erode. Because this is a, an amazing aquifer. So I'm guessing, and I, again, I'm guessing that if we had contaminants, salt and those kind of things, they've already, been rinsed away and we're just left with something that's actually pretty easily to, to deal with. You just scrape off the soils with the heavy metals in them and they go somewhere else. Okay. Well, thanks for that input. Um, so again, at this point in time, I think I, I would agree with Bill. This makes sense for us to go ahead and make this happen. And then okay, leverage, I, I, whatever I, leverage whatever opportunities we have from a, from grants perspective to remediate uh, the work uh, down the road. I think it's a good investment. Okay, I think the phase one was in, that we did was actually encouraging when we knew this stuff was there, right? It didn't. So I do want to, I think, clarify the, the, uh, the fact that if we, that the right vote here would be a motion to recommend a select board approving the lot 57 phase two environmental site assessment is proposed by VHB and to pay the $14,500 cost for the project with CPA funds appropriated for affordable housing at the 2016 annual town meeting. I tried to write this so it's right, but I believe that it's the town administrator that signs it, correct? So it's, since it's, if you have CPA money that the, um, and the planning board is the affordable housing committee, do we have, can we approve this without their, you know, Bill? Can we send a motion? Know. Can we make the motion to send that the notice to the selectman to do that or the town manager? Yeah, I think that, um, I think that's what we did last time because it's the town administrator that signs the contract. It's not the board signatures. Mm. I don't think he acts without the approval of the select board. So if you if you'll accept that friendly amendment to your motion, Bill, that that's the wording. I will. Mallory, I can send it to you if you didn't get it. Um, and Francois, do you want to second it? Francois is muted. Okay. Uh, I do second it. Apologies. Yes. Okay. Are, are there any discussions from anybody else or 
Any additional questions? If not, somebody want to take the first vote to? Bill Holman's aye. Steiger aye. Christopher Monroe aye. Demelia aye. Sorry, I stepped on John's. All of us, it's unanimous. Okay, thanks. We will get them started. The great agreement says they'll be back to us in a month. The problem will be then we don't have really enough of those funds left to proceed fully to the next stage, but we can't get to the next stage without spending these money. So it's a catch 22. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. Wow, okay. Um, we're through our action items, but um, we have a, a lot of other a lot, of, a lot of other items on the on the list. Uh, the first is we promised I promised you at the last meeting that we would look into what it would cost to get um, to get Bill to help us with this new draft of the solar bylaw, which would uh, I guess we determined um, you know put in some much needed guidance on where you can locate solar fields and how big they should be and and so forth. Uh, based on the draft I presented, which was based on the Athol um, model, which I thought was much better than ours. But, uh, and I think the next step in that would be, if we go ahead with, the, um, with it, is that Bill would work with me to generate a, a list of the things that we need to decide as the planning board. You know, the size limits of both the field, um, the lot, the coverage, the areas we're going to allow it in, sort of major issues um, as a next step. And maybe that should have been the first step. But but anyway, uh, he's agreed to help us. He cited a fee of somewhere between 2500 and 3600 uh, We do have those funds available. We have, um, I had Mallory look into it that we could use for that purpose, and it wouldn't deplete the funds. We'd have enough to to cover other things that would likely come up. Um, but um, Francois took on the part of this, which of course we've been discussing in parity with it all along, which is what to do with the, um, the I, I get the name of this wrong. So it's the battery storage facility bylaw, which involves BESS, energy storage, battery energy storage systems. Um, in Athol, they did both bylaws in tandem, and Athol had the first of the BESS, they call it BESS, that's the abbreviation, zoning bylaws in the state, I believe, from talking to that. So, and I just was exhausted from trying to do something with solar, but he, he was able to, had some time and put together um, a potential draft to begin to work from, also based on the ethyl bylaw. Um, and so the question for us tonight is, to, do we want them to, to consider them together? But I want to give Francois a chance to, I know it was posted very late. I sent it to everybody. I don't know how many people got to read it. But you want to talk about your draft a little bit? Sure. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the document that I sent has multiple elements, but the very last element is the one that relates to the battery energy storage system. What is important to note here is, is that um, as, 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 as was noted by, uh, by Alice, the, uh, there, is, there, there was really no model for us to leverage. However, we did get uh, notification from the gentleman he worked, we worked with um, from, the, uh, from Athol that a bylaw had been not only drafted, but actually had been passed by, by uh, by the town of Athol. It has a lot of excellent elements and uh, some of which are very specific to them. Those I, uh, those I whittled out. And then I also attempted to integrate things that are more specific to the town of Hubberson. Things very specifically like um, there's a zoning overlay that they created very specifically for this. Whereas on, in, in this draft, and it's just a draft uh, and a proposal that is, is to leverage and utilize the commercial zoning uh, area. Uh, the other thing was there are, there's wording uh, specifically with regards to the last set of articles in terms of the um, uh, 
the, the bond that, that has to be uh, presented. It was, it was drafted very differently by the town of Athol, whereas what I attempted to do here was really model it more to how uh, Hubberston has, uh, uh, has done this here for the uh, large, large scale uh, ground mounted solar, uh, solar system. Uh, there's also reporting requirements, which is not part of the um, zoning bylaw that has been adopted by Athol. Uh, so there's a few elements which are more flavored to what Hubberston would be. Uh, uh, people are, are the people in Hubberston would have been accustomed to, and again, much much of it based on what the large scale ground mounted solar system bylaw looks like. Again. Um, I cannot take ownership for this here because this truly is uh, a compendium of items that come from Athol and peppered with elements from our own bylaw. Um, I, I encourage you to look at this here. Uh, I think there is an opportunity for the town to, uh, in the future and sometimes potentially even near future, uh, to be able to draw, um, I wanna say um, interest uh, by companies who would like to uh, uh, utilize the the, uh, the land that we have for, for, for that purposes, and it could bring potential revenue uh, for the town. So I'm happy to look at this here jointly with other members. Um, any questions that you have, I'll try to answer them as best as I can at this point in time too. Thank you. I have a question. Is the revenue to the town through a pilot program? Are these subject to pilot agreements? You know, that we get a well, it's interesting because the zoning bylaw itself does not mention that for the large, large uh, ground mounted solar systems, but I would assume that there is certainly something that can be uh, included to that effect. Do you have any knowledge, Bill, of whether their pilot agreements apply to BESSES, as they call them? I don't. Um... But the reason the zoning bylaw is moved on that is because that's a tax and revenue issue. Correct. And, it, and so the zoning bylaw is not supposed to address that. Uh, I would suspect that they are because that's really a discretionary item for the planning board. Uh, and the state treasury department would probably have a memo on it, but we could look that up pretty straightforwardly. Okay. So I guess, I guess, um, you know, I do think money is going to be pumped into renewable energies of all kinds. And this would sort of be one, one chance we have to get ahead of the curve instead of being behind it. Um, how, so we, we have a couple of questions as a board here. We can decide, we can proceed with solar, put the fee limit in it and get, let them get started on that. And because this came in so late, we can hold over, give everybody more of a chance to read it if you haven't had a chance and bring it back. Um, at our next meeting, or we could refer them both. What is what do people want to do? May I ask a quick question? Um, what is our timeline if we wanted to present this here to the town as part of the town meeting? I, I don't think we can get it to, until the fall town meeting at this point with all the for hurdles both we have. Or just for the best are you talking about? I think the solar too. I think it's okay. you're talking multiple meetings on this. Very well. And in uh, that's that's fine. Then there, I I understand. We're we're kind of late into this here. Um, thank you, Alice. The deadline to get anything onto the Springtown meeting is April twelfth. Okay, we have a couple of things we're working on tonight. Mm -hmm. Not much, but um, further down the list. Let's though not not take things out of sequence, or we'll get lost. Um, <laughs> our audience there. Um. Bill, have I you had a chance to, I'm sorry to interrupt here, Madam Chair. Bill, uh, quick question to Bill. Bill, have you had a chance to, uh, was, was this shared at all with Bill, Madam Chair? Uh, did I share it with you or did you pick it up from posted documents? It was very late, so. Which Bill? You, you Bill, Bill Murray. Murray. <laughs> did you get a William. chance to look at we'll Francis? We'll call you, we'll call you William. I, I got, I'm, in, I'm in the sidelines here, I just listen. <laughs> I got it around four o'clock today, uh, so I glanced through it. Okay. Uh, I did, however, talk to my business partner about it. 
And we both agree that we are not electrical engineers. And at some point, you know, we can certainly look at it for zoning and a lot of the other compliance parts, but we can't look at it from a technical aspect. And it needs to be looked at from a technical aspect to make sure that there aren't any serious engineering flaws that we're requiring something that is not either practical or possible. Uh, and my partner and I would not know what those are. It has to be reviewed by a, an electrical engineer that's familiar with this kind of system to make sure we're, uh, whether we're being inviting or prohibitive or something other in another direction, we just wouldn't know technically uh, any of that information. So that would have to go, that would have to be part of the scope. May, may I may I ask then when when we reviewed the 147 Williams Hill Road, uh, the battery energy storage system there, was was that review done also by an electrical engineer, or was that uh, only done uh, with you or with places and associates? Well, it was submitted to uh, the town's electrical inspector, and it was mm -hmm. submitted under the stamp of an electrical engineer. But yeah, we just reviewed it for safety and compliance. Mm -hmm. But this is this is a regulation, so this this is saying you shall do this or you shall not do this. And if we don't have a technical expert saying what you shall and shall not do, and disconnects, reconnects, and all the other kind of thing, then we could be shooting ourselves in the foot while we're trying to encourage something. Francois, perhaps we could get from Mr. Smith, from Eric Smith, who they used. I, I think that may be a very good idea. And that is uh, certainly something that we could pursue with him directly. Yes. So my suggestion is, and Bill, you can ask your guy too, you know, if you, if you have an electrical engineer you work with, why don't we take the vote on the solar, whether we want to get going on the solar tonight? And why don't we take the other one up with a few more after talking to Mr. Smith and letting Bill think about it and giving everybody on the board a chance to read it in more detail. I know I was only able to, because of all the other crazy things, to read it. And it's not light reading. You know, you really have to read it and think about it. Um, so bump, bump this to April 1st to make a decision on it. Maybe we'll have more answers by then. Would that be okay? And Bill, you can think about what it would cost in addition to review it. I have no problems at all with that, uh, uh, Alice. And uh, I appreciate the fact that um, this came in late um, and, and we wanna do a good job with this here. And it's novel. It is, it's related, but it's different. Um, so- Alice, Bill Holmes, I agree we should probably review it further and do a good job with it. Okay. So we'll, we'll bifurcate the two, as they say, and we'll put the BESS, I'm getting used to the acronym, BESS, B-E-S-S, for our battery <laughs> energy storage systems, on for the next agenda on the first. And Mallory, remind me, either Francois or I'll talk to Eric Smith and see how they handled that electrical, the electrician component, um, electrical engineering component of the review. Um, Again, I don't take a lot of ownership of this solar bylaw draft. I just think that our personal, personally, I think that we have a bylaw that doesn't, that pretty much allows solar anywhere because it's allowed in all residential agricultural districts, which is 95% of the town. And there are no, not very many, the setbacks are poor, the size is not limited. So I think it's time to take this on. but. Uh, my feelings won't be hurt if people do not want to do that. Um, but we do have the money to have it reviewed and we can plug along with the hope of maybe getting it revised by the fall. And I think with some hope that the select board will support us this go, this go around because they weren't as like negative as they were last year when we tried to float this. So I don't know, do you have a mo do we have a motion to, to to go forward with our revision, study, studying revision of the solar bylaw, including um, retaining places associates to be our consultants on it for a fee not to exceed $3,600.
Madam Chair, I'll make that motion. This is uh, Francois Steiger. I will second that motion. Is there further discussion? Okay, let's vote. Christopher, oh, you made the motion. Lived all aye. Steiger, aye. Damalia, aye. Bill Holman's aye. Monroe, aye. Okay. So, Bill, we'll talk about creating that list of decisions for maybe getting back to them just with some basic questions on the first. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me, but before we move too far off of the, the battery storage uh, proposal, uh, I did have one quick question and one comment on that um, because I did only have a, a brief amount of time to read it, but it did appear that in its broadest reading, it would prohibit small residential size systems uh, like people are already using and are currently contracted with National Grid for, um, I can't remember the name of the program, it's like connect something or other, where they're actually contracted with National Grid to feed power back to the grid. Um, so I, I would like to see a revision in that or a discussion about it, um, because people who own electric cars, uh, people who have solar systems on their house, they're already using this technology and they're installing it on a regular basis. So I, I wouldn't be in support of a broad prohibition of a technology that's already out there. I think the answer to that question is because I kind of raised the same the same thing came comes up with the solar. You know, you don't want to hit the solar fields, they're the solar panels on roofs and so on. Is you limit it to um, commercial size, you know, to a certain kilowatt, right? Yeah. That does which doesn't prohibit the smaller ones. They just need to go through the building department. So, so to to Christopher's point, though, I think there's what is known as a tier one versus a tier two. And what the what this bylaw specifically, the wording on it is, is it is really truly indicating that this is for tier two. And I, I appreciate what Christopher is saying. I was not aware that we already had uh, folks in um, the town of Hoverson who have uh, like the Tesla-like battery storage systems that, that you typically put in the house and use them as a backup. Um, there's been some concerns about that specifically with regards to fire departments uh, not being uh, uh, involved with understanding how it is that they need to mitigate, you know, fires or, or address things like that. I, I, what I wanted to indicate here is, is that we would not be addressing that. And I think that the town at some point in time needs to address that from a bylaw perspective. Specifically, I don't think it, it makes sense to, to, to prohibit it. Uh, maybe we need to, to modify the wording and uh, do something in such a way that uh, we can indicate that this has to be addressed, but will be addressed potentially at a later time. I agree with you, Christopher. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not disputing that. Uh, the wording probably could can be can be uh, enhanced uh, in the bylaw itself. Yeah, thank you. Be because when looking at it, it it draws the line at everything below 600 kilowatt hours. Now, right. if it was to set a range that was like from 25 kilowatt hours to 600 becomes that tier one. And then uh, everything smaller than that is micro consumer scale or something along the lines of that, because the, the Tesla systems are 13.5 kilowatt hours. Okay. And looking at what some of the other companies like Generac and um, what National Grid's actually recommending, it's all units that are in that kind of size range that are from that 10,000 to 20,000 kilowatt hours. So I think it makes perfect sense for us to do some more investigation. This is again, being a draft, it is certainly up for, uh, for modifications and enhancements. When Francois and I talked to Eric Smith, he said the same thing. Well, we haven't, we do intend to regulate the smaller units, maybe in the future, but this doesn't do it, but we can look around and see. It, it's new, you know, this area of regulation is new, so. We'll look into it. Okay, so we'll take it up again and we'll try to have some more questions, some more answers for your questions on the first. Um, okay, so I just, because what that, uh, Mallory just said, which is we have an April 15th deadline for articles, um, one, one we, which we had, let me, Oh, hang on one second. If I 
if I get too lost, then I'll never find myself. Wait a minute. One of the, the one that we really were willing to do something about, and then I want to, uh, Fran uh, Francois, remind me to get back to your comments mm -hmm. on sure. articles that exist. Um, is the rate of development by law. I think everybody agreed, uh, it, it, I mean, there wasn't a vote, but on the select board when we had that joint meeting that it is expiring, the rate of um, development by law actually expires um, on July 31st of this year and that we should extend it. Um, and the quote we talked, I talked about extending it a year as opposed to extending it another whatever. Um, but I just, as a way of background on that, so this bylaw, this rate of development bylaw was adopted on May 3rd of 2001. So we're coming up on the 20 years. Its original expiration date, I think, was five years after its passage, which would have been 2005, 15 years ago. Um, it was amended actually once. The one time it was amended, it excluded, there, well, there was a cap built into the original. Um, there was a, uh, an exclusion from that cap of, I think it's 34 units, I'll have to look at it again, for single lots that were in existence at the time of the passage. And, and they took that exclusion out to make it applicable to all lots um, that weren't built on. That was in 2002. So then nothing happens until there were th three more amendments, 2005, 2009, 2016, but I think all they did is extend the existing bylaw in its entirety the way it's written. So basically we got a 20 year old bylaw. <clears throat> um, and I think that's why I think, and we've got, it's, you know, it's a, a master plan year, which is also kind of a once in 20 year development. So that's why I thought we should only extend it for a year to give us some chance to really think about whether it still meets our needs. So I was gonna propose, um, right now, right now the, the paragraph, the relevant paragraph in the bylaw that we need would need to amend on the warrant reads periodic review and expiration. And it says every year following the adoption of this bylaw, the planning board shall report to town meeting the effectiveness of this bylaw, the need for its continuation to further the purposes stated in section 6.1 above and any recommendations for amendments. And then it says the last sentence, this bylaw shall expire July 1, 2021. So I think all we need to do for the warrant article is say, to amend the last sentence of article six rate of development, section 6.8 periodic review and expiration, to extend the expiration date in the bylaw for, for one year, specifically to read, this bylaw shall expire July 1st, 2022. I think, I think that does it. Um, I don't know, but I'm willing to consider going longer. I just think that, should you really let something be for 20 years that? Alice, Bill Holmes, I think that's a great idea. And I think it gives us the time to really look into this and read it, read up on it and see what we want to do. One year gives us plenty of time and we don't have time between now and then to really review it and put in a good recommendation. Okay, so Bill, you want to um, make a motion that we ask the select board to put that warrant article on, that we submit that warrant article to the select board? Yes, I will. A second, anybody? Or further discussion? This is John Demelia, I second. Okay. We need, we need to get it in because we're up against the deadline coming up. And by the way, okay. just a point of correction, uh, so a point of information. Um, did I hear you say it was April 15th or April 12th what the deadline was? I thought I had heard earlier from Mallory that it's actually the 12th of April. I want to make sure that we have the dates correct. So yeah. I don't miss the what, deadline. What is the deadline, Mallory? Did you say the 12th? It is the 12th. It is the 12th. Okay, I yep. got that wrong. Okay, so we need to we need to do this. We probably shouldn't just, you know, it was clear that they wanted it extended because somebody could come with a huge project and exceed that 28 cap. Um, okay, so we're ready to vote on recommending the warrant article to the Board of Selectmen. Do we get a second? 
Yes, I seconded. Okay, are ready to vote? Live to all aye. Tiger aye. Monroe aye. Demelia aye. Bill Holman's aye. Okay, so that's unanimous. And um, I don't know, Mallory, whether I sent this to you, but remind me and I'll send it if I haven't. Okay. Thank you. I do want it, I do want it sent out and I'm out of town next week, so I'll try to get it to you before I turn off the lights for the night. All right. Um, the other thing are that, that uh, this is what Francois brought up, is the posted, we made two amendments last year. They were that the um, alternate member has to be uh, from the town, a resident of town. And the other one was to eliminate the expired article on the marijuana, the uh, medical marijuana moratorium article. Um, and then we got rulings from town council that I think one and one didn't actually have to go to a vote. But anyway, the problem is that I know those were resolved, but they still appear on the official version of the bylaws that are posted and in our documents too, our, our document file. So can you look into getting those, re getting those revisions, you know, get, getting rid of them and getting them corrected? And report back to us if you have any problems doing that, Mallory. Sure. I think Christina was working on it and then the ball got dropped. But okay. they, need, they do need to be cleaned up, but I think they've been voted on. I think it's just literally a matter of doing the editing and fixing the posting. Okay. Um, okay. Was that the only two principal? I know there were changes to the solar bylaw, but we're going to take those up. Is what we're okay, going to and talk about. The, sol the solar bylaw was really the addition of some definitions, which I thought would be uh, important to include. If you're including them as part of your uh, amended bylaw, I have no problems at all with that. And the other one was just a, gl a glorious typo I saw. Oh, yeah, <laughs> there are a number of them. But go ahead, tell Mallory, and she can fix it while she's fixing things. Uh, I, I don't have it here in front of me. One it's, it's the rate of development, but something. Yeah, it's de de development. <laughs> <If there's a laughs> no, it's missing a spelling. Okay. Right. So, I mean, there's one other hilarious be, typo. Would not, would not be a bad idea to to maybe uh, just do a spell check on the whole document and uh, itemize them and just present them to the select board as spelling mistakes that need to be corrected and whether or not the town will accept that and just basically list them out. I don't think that should be controversial at all. Well, Mallory, however you can help us clean them yeah, up. Absolutely. And just then report back what you were or weren't able to do and we'll try to take care of the rest. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, there is, I actually have a new business item. Um, Bill is still here too. He had something we, we wanted to talk about. Um, the new, the new business, it's not really new business, it's kind of a report. You know, I'm a, I'm the member of the, the Montachusett Joint Transportation Committee. So I go to their, I go to their meetings and most of it's Greek to me because they talk about, you know, the design of roundabouts and stuff. But this time I went to the meeting and it was great. And I just wanted to let people know um, the status of things. I, everybody's probably aware of the, um, the fact that this summer we're going to get the highway reconstruction of Route, six, Route 68, um, which is Main Street, from a thousand feet north of Williamsville Road to the Elm to Elm Street. Our whole, you know, revision of that center district, including the lamp posts and sidewalks and everything, is going to be done. It's a 2022 project. It's, it's only one of two projects that like this that they're going to fund this year. So um, I just think it's something to celebrate. It's a $5,241,283 project, and it's going to happen this summer. So I wanted to, um, to tell you that, that all those votes were put in. And also, they have then a list of projects everybody puts in their projects and then they sit on the list for however long they sit on the list and they eventually make uh, the 2020 projects to be funded from 2022 to 2026. 
uh, on the state prioritized projects. And I also want to let the board know that uh, we have a project on that list, uh, which is to replace a bridge on Williamsville Road that crosses Burn the Burnshirt River, mm -hmm. um, which is a uh, $1,692,891 project. And it will be funded sometime before, if all goes well, before now in 2026. So I thought that was worth worth your knowing. Um, well, thank you, Alice. And also, um, Ryan put in for a small, they have these grants. And um, so he put in one to study the intersection, intersection analysis grant. It's under the transportation planning studies from a program called Unified Planning Work Program. And it's going to study the intersection at the end of High Street, High Street and 68, um, which is, should help with our sort of town center district um, revival and, um, you know, tie in well with the master plan, I think, to have that data. So I wanted to kudos to, to Ryan for getting that. Um, and there was one other thing is, oh, and then we, he also put in for um, developing an official road list, which every town is supposed to have, the clerk's office is supposed to have it, we've been through this before, and somebody shredded it when they were burned it or whatever, when they had the papers hauled off, and we don't actually have an official town roads list, according to a number of sources, but Bill, Bill Murray, who's, who's there, um, but they're willing to, so he put in a, a grant to help develop a true, you know, official list, roads list. So um, I'm going to work on that. I think that I'm not sure what the grant offers and what we want are the same, but if we could clean up like the roads that were rec recommended 20 years ago to be discontinued, whether they're roads or not, whether these roads that are trails into the state forest and now dead end are roads or not, whether the Comet Pond roads are roads, you know, it would really help. That discontinued, you know, road that we had on our A and R the other day. So I'm hoping that may come to fruition. And um, Travis and I are talking about it with Mr. Dixon, our new town administrator. So anyway, not looking for action, just letting you know what's going on. Um, under new business, also, Bill, maybe we can talk about. We had this issue. The issue is what whether the protections afforded agriculture under the Zoning Act, the, the Massachusetts general law, apply to marijuana establishments, or whether this new case that came out of um, Oxford and, and the land court um, changed that. So, because this does affect things, it affects I don't know, Bill could explain it more, but it's it's relevant to both the 56 Gardner Road and the 69 Gardner Road projects. Um, and our town council, you know, I said, well, can we get an opinion on this? Well, I did call town council at the um, the urging of Mr. Dick, uh, Mr. Nixon. And um, she said, this is very, very clear that um, that because I think I actually misrepresented it to you that the court case did not overturn or repeal any part of that bylaw, uh, any part of the general law. And the general law that defines agriculture, the agricultural protections do not apply to growing marijuana. So Bill was looking for that as he is he does his review of this proposal and I wanted it clarified and she's very clear on that. So I don't think we need to get an opinion because it's black and white in the statute. Um, I don't know, Bill, do you want to say anything more about that? Sure, just, just to follow up. In order to do my review of these two projects, <clears throat> the first one, uh, 69, asserted that the court case set a precedent that applies to their project. 
And I just simply asked Alice, we need to figure out if that court case set a precedent or not, if it applies to us or not. Uh, and I think you did a great job on a very short amount of time. Um, it, it does not. And the big deal is uh, the zoning bylaws say that agriculture has a lot, a lot of exemptions. In other words, portageons absolutely have to be allowed for an agricultural use, um, but not for a commercial use and access and drainage and infrastructure and all those things that are really integral to a, a commercial use don't really apply to an agricultural use, they're exempt. And so the planning board, if, if it was determined to be agricultural, my review would be a dramatically different review than what the, the guidance that we got uh, or the answer to the question that we got is. So it is a commercial use, it's not exempt. So I treat it no differently than a retail store. I, I treat it no differently than any other commercial use uh, with in terms of compliance to our zoning bylaws and, and other applicable regulations. So that defined for me what my scope will be and, uh, and I don't have to pay attention to the assertion of the applicant that they're exempt. Does it make sense to everybody? What the town council who does this said to me was what they tried to do in Charlton in that case that the land court heard was the zoning bylaw allowed marijuana as a use. And they tried to kind of do an end run around that by saying the general bylaw, by passing a general bylaw that wouldn't allow it, or maybe they had the general bylaw anyway, and they were trying to amend it. And, and basically the holding was that you couldn't uh, uh, pass a general bylaw that would overrule a zoning bylaw. You could see why it would be advantageous because a general bylaw, at least in Charlton, only required a majority vote and all zoning bylaws by state law require a two thirds vote. Right. He said that's where this question of this question came up. But she said it's really very clear. And what Bill also said is if you look at the regulations that he has to work with too, they don't, they're consistent with the, um, the, the state law, the state agriculture, law right. right, is not that that uh, growing marijuana is not an agricultural use. Um, so anyway, we spent a lot of time working on that. That's kind of a footnote to this meeting, but okay. So the only other thing is that I have, um, which might be, it's a point to start an interesting discussion, is this in-law apartment, which we're obviously not going to try to squeeze onto this warrant, but. I promised you when we laughed last time <clears throat> that I would look at these communities we identified as benchmark towns, you know? I mean, everybody but Christopher, I guess, remembers doing that exercise. So Christopher, what we did is we, uh, this was at the urging of, uh, of many committees on uh, in town were urged to do so by, uh, by Ryan, our town manager, is to come up with communities that we think we would like, that we, Think would be appropriate models for us that we aspire to be. Um, so when I was looking at what other communities were doing with their accessory apartments, so-called in-law apartments, I used, that's where I got those lists. I wasn't shopping for places that said one thing or another. So I looked at Ashburnham, Athol, Princeton, Sterling, and Westminster. <laughs> and that's the... Um, and then I just cut and pasted their provisions. And I think it's interesting that all of these towns have gone to uh, accessory dwelling units um, regulation and none of them have like our bylaw restriction that the occupant of the apartment has to be related. Um, and I, I presented it as, as, because this is where people present it to me was that the, um, ways in which you could increase affordable housing in town, perhaps. Um, but I don't think it's a particularly an affordable housing issue. I think it's a, I think it's logical. And this is what people are to found, you know, is that you build an in-law apartment, you know, when uh, your parent reaches 80, whatever the magic age is, and you put it on there and she's dead at 90, and then you've got an apartment um, and, 
you know, you're the homeowner, you're not going to rent it to somebody irresponsible and you can't be forced to rent it to anybody under the state law that protects housing because it's four units or more. So why not open it up to other people um, and, and let trust the judgment of the homeowner. Nobody's going to go out and spend, you know, 200,000, 150, 200,000 to put an in-law apartment on for the sake of making money. And it might have several things. It might um, also allow a senior that's in their house that maybe still has the debt on that in-law apartment to earn a little money, you know, to earn a little rent to offset it because the parent died in five years instead of 10 or whatever. Anyway, it's my pitch. It is something to think about. I'm not asking for any answers tonight, um, but um, I propose, it would allow for the nannies, it would allow for the caretakers and our bylaw does none of the above. So I think it's time to look at it again. Comments? <laughs> Alice, I think it's wonderful you're doing all this work. Yeah, I know it's a, it's a lot to do. Um, you're putting a lot into it and I really appreciate that. Um, and I think this is awesome. I think it's something we probably should update to the town. Well, well, thanks, Bill. Anyway, it's not something we're trying to make happen right now, but we could put it along to something to consider this fall and begin that discussion. Um, so that's it. I'm not up to drafting something right now, I'm, <laughs> but it's food for thought. You bring up a very good point in terms of the affordable housing and a question that I would raise, are there angles in which towns like ours or adjoining towns that have low affordable housing numbers can potentially lever the, can leverage this here? I mean, I'm just presenting this here sort of like as a, as a, as a seed to, to think about if we are going to be doing something of this nature and see if there's any additional benefits that come out of this year. That's what Bill Holmes, I was thinking the same thing. Maybe we could offset our affordable housing numbers. With this aspect again, I don't, I don't know if that is possible. I think it's just something that we need to understand whether or not there is a potential for that. And if so, how does this, how would this have to be grafted or, or, or worded in such a way that it could potentially benefit uh, the town of Hoverson when it comes to affordable housing units, the total number? Because we do, we do suffer from that. And, and we've had some We've had some concerns about us not being able to meet those numbers. You know, I don't know whether we could make it. I mean, that might be really intruding too much into a homeowner's to have any fil to be a filter. You'd have to screen people, you know, or something. I think. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. More, think that, I'm that, thinking more of it as a designation, and, and as to whether or not there's a way in which, from a designation perspective, it can be actually leveraged. There may be. I know. I know some of the bigger cities they have. The problem becomes with our small town is who's going to administer this stuff. You know, it's, it's, it requires screening and submitting and I, I don't know, I could look into it. I, I do think that when the state looks at whether you're trying, it, the smaller stuff does matter too. You know, you can say, well, we changed our very restrictive bylaw to now read this. And even though it isn't an SHI unit, it, it does help with the problem. Precisely. You know, so, so I, I just think it's worth thinking about, and, and I know I got it out late to people, but they do require a special permit for an in-law apartment, and they do all require that they can't be severed. The owner has to occupy either the, you know, has to own both and has to occupy either the accessory apartment or the main house. So say you, you decide you're old, getting older and you want to take you know, the in-law apartment and let your kids move into the big house that would be okay um and anyway they there's all kinds of regulations some are very non-restricted barry has virtually nothing that restricts it and and um westminster has quite a detailed bylaw restricting it so westminster so oh ashburnham has quite because ashburnham you know does have that it does complicate things, I think, if you're a, um, you know, a town that has a lot of students in it, one way or another. Maybe that affected why theirs is so elaborate. But I just want people to think about conceptually what we want to do with this bylaw, and I think we should amend it to 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 uh, to be more accommodating to homeowners as well. 
that own these apartments so they don't just sit vacant. Or I think that the reality is that nobody pays attention to this bylaw anyway. If you're gonna, you know, we'll go ahead and let their, you know, best friend's daughter move in instead while she's a college student up at, you know, while she's a community college. I mean, I think that just goes on or, or but anyway. I'm not asking for answers. I just want to put it out there. Point taken. Thank you. And I don't think, let me just check my list. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, going on with this, there's not much. There's the Habitat for Humanity finally got the purchase and sales agreement signed by the town. Their closing on that lot is not until July or June 1st. So I don't know whether they're even going to get that house built that summer, but it's some progress. Uh, Mallory was going to check in with Sandy on the CPA tax title properties. Any word on that? She didn't have any update. No update. Okay. Um, I did. I did um, on the master plan. I've been going back and forth with the master planning people. They don't have any easy way to uh, to tag in how much. They say all this land is available to develop up in the northern corner of our county. And I said, well, have you subtracted the hundreds of acres and gravel pits up there because they're not exactly prime development? And they asked if I could get a list of those pits and the acreage of the pits and the same thing with the solar fields, how many solar fields in town and the acreage in, in them. So I asked for help because these things are coded in the assessor's records with the code. And Jenny, who's in a, um, who works there is going to give us a list of both the number of pits and how many acres and number of parcels, you know, where that's their primary use and the use codes. So the number of acres involved in both and the number of owners in both. So I thought that, and then I'll send it on for the land to the woman who's doing the land use chapter. Um, administrative matters, I think. Oh, correspondence. Uh, we, we can anticipate at some point two more special permits coming in. The one from Robert Loring on North Comet Pond Road that <coughs> has the lot that Roland would not give a building permit on because he doesn't recognize North Comet Pond Road, but it's a pre existing house. So I think we're going to get a filing from him. And uh, Jennifer Woods is a local veterinarian with six dogs and she wants a kennel license. Um, we said, sorry, the limit's four. You got to get a special permit because that's the way it reads. So we will be hearing from her, but in the meantime, she's going to, she, she wrote me an email that said, I'm going to renew my private kennel license for four of the six dogs, and I'm going to ship the other two out to live with my mother. So anyway, we may see her soon. So that's it. That's it. Our next um, meeting is really important that we get people there because it's a hearing on 56. And we need to have, you know, 69. you need to attend every hearing if you're going to be, I'm sorry, what? 69. 69, right. It's the, the actual public hearing on that. And you've got to attend the hearings to vote on the outcome. So if you're not going to be able to make it on April 1st, let us know as soon as you can. Try to move other things and make that a priority if you possibly can. That's it. I'll take a motion to adjourn unless people have other things or there's any member of the public. <laughs> Anybody else out there, Mallory? Nope, just us. Okay, someone want Madam, to make a motion? Madam Chair, I, this is Professor Steyer. I'd like to uh, put a motion forth to uh, adjourn the meeting. I'll second that motion, John Demelia. Okay. Liptal, yes? Bill Holmes, aye. Demelia, aye. Monroe, aye. Tiger eye. All right.